introduce our speakers, I want, just want to recognize um, our volunteers and students who helped to make this happen, and especially Caitlin Bryson, who managed the, a large part of this exhibit and is also managing a performance piece that Victoria is doing uh, at the uh, New Mexico History Museum tomorrow. Um, and it's been a lot, and she's doing her thesis. <laughs> so thank you. And um, also Viola Arduini, who's helping us with the uh, camera work today, and um, is also an art, art and biology person. Talk to her about her work. It's fascinating and wonderful. Uh, Paul Ross, who's studying landscape architecture, and um, should you should also talk to him about some of his ideas related to plant life and uh, structures. Pretty amazing. Um, also, Paul Ward is one of our AmeriCorps VISTAs in our STEAM New Mexico project, and he's a roboticist. And is there anybody else? That's, I missed, no. Um, so thank, thank you all for your help in making this happen. So our first presenter um, is Anna MacArthur. She is, um, and, I, and I think what I might do is just uh, introduce all the presenters at once, and then we'll just go one after the other. So um, Anna MacArthur is, has such a varied and incredible practice. Uh, as I'm learning more and more about her, she's been in Santa Fe for a long time, but has traveled, as you'll hear, all around the world, uh, working with natural forms, working with high technology, uh, she has a long history working with holography. You'll see some of her wonderful, one of her one, two of her wonderful holograms uh, in the hall, and um, is also just a fantastic community member and collaborator that I'm so happy to have met and connected with through this project. So, um, welcome Anna. Uh, after Anna, we'll hear about the work of um, Allison. Kudla. Allison is coming from the Systems, Bi Systems Biology Institute in Seattle. And she, I first saw uh, Allison's amazing work at the MoMA uh, for a show, an exhibition called Biodesign. And I also am collaborating with um, Allison on a Keck Foundation um, project um, to explore aspects of the microbiome. And Allison is a a wonderful collaborator. I'm so I wish you were here in Santa Fe <laughs> so we could collaborate more. But we talk on the phone and our our conference call with all our other collaborators once a week, and <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Um, and finally, um, Victoria Vesna, who I've known I think for probably 20 years, uh, and has just um, is someone I think who has been a role model for me. Um, I I saw. Um, I first saw your work when you were in the Planetary Collegium, or at that time had a different uh, name, uh, but a, a, the, one of the first PhD programs for art science uh, run by uh, Roy, started by Roy Ascot. And um, I followed Victoria's work for years and years, and um, what she's done, not only with her work, but also as um, an organizer of the Art Science Center at UCLA is, is just um, very inspiring and it's just been a role model for me. So uh, with that said, I will turn it over to Anna and we'll just go straight through and have five. And it's a beautiful work, but there wasn't much other research. I was kind of amazed. And then time went by as it does with artists, other projects came up and then in 2002, I decided to make some holograms, which are here of the morpho. Because of its nanostructure, it came up instantly. And if you make, these are dichromate holograms. If you make a lot of dichromate holograms, when a hologram comes up instantly, you know it has a really bright structure or something. A mirror would come up instantly. Um, so, and this was a work called Necessary Pupils for Climate Change. It was kind of a book and a library with um, uh, four other, um, pupils and books of four other specimens. Um, then in 2008, I was given, sorry, um, in 2008 I met Dr. Pete Bakuzik, who is one of the authorities now on the physics of the blue book. He also did very early research. So I met him at a conference in 2008. We struck up a great conversation back and forth. And finally in 2013, um, I was awarded a residency to work in his lab. And the goal, the interest, this is him writing some 
uh, physics formulas and then explaining it through drawings. Um, the goal was to try to output a three-dimensional model of this complicated nanoarchitecture. So this is a blue morpho, it's the Didius species. And I'm gonna take you through as you're zooming, zooming in with the microscope. So when you come in a little bit closer to the wing, you see a kind of scintillating pixel quality, which uh, those pixels are the scales. You come in further, you actually see the scales, which look like tiles on a roof. Some have ripped off in the center. And you keep going in, and you get to this place where you start to see these little striations, stripes. Um, I'll say something about the underside. That is only pigment. So the color is created by pigment, whereas the other blue side is created by structural color. Okay, and this is a morpho retinor. It is, um, all the morphos are basically made of cuticle and air. Okay, then I did a whole series with Pete of scanning electron microscope images. And Pete's comment at the end was that I got very lucky now. He was helping me, but you, you're, it's like flying in and you don't know where you're gonna land and you only have so much time on the uh, SEM. So this is a morpho retina again, and it is, you, there's a measurement if anyone want, cares, down below it says four uh, microns. Um, you can see the striations, you're seeing them even deeper. Each scale is attached to the wing by a socket. And then um, this is uh, the retina as well. And when you find a damaged point, it's, it's really good because you can zoom in. So you're zooming in and you can now see closer what those stripes are about and the, the nano architecture, which is these uh, ridges that are made of uh, parallel levels of lamellae. And here's three different species showing the lamellae. So it's the lamellae that's creating the structural blue color, the iridescence. And the more, the higher the stacks, the brighter it is. It's another species. And all these have different kind of um, self-organizing qualities. This is a great one because all of the morpho, some, more than, some species more than others, they have the denser scales underneath, which I've mostly been showing you, that create the uh, brilliant iridescent blue. And then on top are these glass scales where the ridges are spread apart and the glass scales act like a kind of diffuser and actually amplify the iridescence and uh, make the parallax or angle of view even wider. So these are really sophisticated organisms. Another view of the glass scale. And then a few uh, TEM, transmission electron microscope, where it's a different process but you can see even more detail. This shows the thicker main scale and then the glass scale with the lamellae separated up above. So then I started the tedious process of 3D rendering. And it was really tedious, but it's the, the best way to learn about an organism <laughs> because um, the X and the Y axis were terribly difficult. I worked with one SEM image. But when I got to the Z, that's what was hard because the structure is so complex with those arches, which are called trabeculae, are kind of alternating. So I made four of these and then four models and then printed them with laser sintering. And um, I was really, it, I was in awe when I saw the models. And at the same time, they felt stiff for what I know the organism was, but this is what you deal with in these processes. So, um, I made one that comes apart, and so you can really kind of feel the different um, parts, components. And then this slide, I'm um, showing the, some three species and their, um, uh, the, the nano architecture that creates the light. So you can see there's a slight difference. The one all the way to the left, the retinor, is almost mirror-like, so it has many, many more stacks of the lamellae. For those who might get confused, here's a scale uh, relationship. So human hair is 100 microns. You move over to the scale of the butterfly, and it's about the same thickness as the human hair, you could say. And then you come over to the lamellae, which is much tinier, and the height of the lamellae is one micron. OK, um, I, I relate this to all my years of making holograms. So when you make a hologram, very simplistically here, because I have to race through these slides, you, you, with laser light, you split the beam, and you have what's called an object beam, which is hitting the blue object. It's a ball. And then you have the reference beam. So the object beam, that light comes from the object onto your holographic film or plate. 
the reference beam is just straight laser light. And so in essence, what you're doing is you're creating an interference pattern or a weaving of the two wavefronts of laser light. And they record that memory, that interference pattern in the film. So the key connection here is that film or interference pattern is analogous to all those lamellae structures you're looking at. When the white light hits the morpho, it's splitting it up in like a prism, but it's, it's doing something different than the hologram because it's selecting out simply the blue light, a specific uh, wavelength. Um, and in holography, this applies, and it applies in the morpho, when you have waves of all the same wavelength, but if they're traveling in unison and they, they travel together, you get uh, coherent interference, the top diagram, Wave one and wave two, the sum is greater than each of the waves. The bottom part is um, uh, destructive interference where the waves go opposite, so they cancel each other out. So here we have a close-up, and this is what Pete Lukusik described or explained to me, that each one of those distances of the lamellae are about 120 nanometers. If you multiply that by four, you get 480, which is a blue, blue wavelength. So all the blues, the blue, that say 480 hitting this um, are bouncing back off. The other blue wavelengths are either scattered or absorbed. And the ones that are uh, bounced back off are all interfering with each other multiple times. I have some formal drawings, and these are just details where I'm sort of experiencing the um, multiple stacked interference coming off. And then I have drawings that are like sketches in my notebooks that I do really fast when I'm trying to understand something. So I'm, I'm sort of observing patterns with the, the morpho nano architecture and the trabiculae. And then I also learned from one of the biologists about um, how the uh, um, imaginal cells, when the butterfly is in a pupa phase, it dissolves itself, the, uh, the um, caterpillar dissolves itself entirely except for these imaginal cells, which have the blueprint or the code to then build the butterfly. So one biologist explained how a certain imaginal cell is the beginning, and as it grows, becomes the scale. And this is me walking through the process of how she described that. I, I'm fascinated by this partially because of the function and also how we can learn from these phenomenal organisms. <coughs> and, mimic them for interesting uses that also have inherent ecological properties. So these were two um, questions that I was always asking myself. And in sense, you know, does the blue, the intense blue light have a relationship to energy generation? And can one use the nano architecture as a, uh, a set of uh, metaphorical examples for new forms of energy generation? So those thoughts are I keep in mind as I've done this work. To answer those, you have to look at the biome, the rainforest. Um, so the rainforest, sorry, go back. Uh, the Amazon is on the equator, so it's very wet and very moist, a uh, lot of moisture, ideal for growing. Um, huge, incredible amount of photosynthesis because it's 360 <coughs> days out of the year. You have this condition where everything can um, grow like crazy. And so, again, embedded in this project, I feel that the morpho is kind of a, um, a uh, emblematic species for you know, bringing attention to the Amazon and its preservation for the reasons of its incredible biodiversity, even if I think all regions need to be conserved. So um, one thing that comes to mind that I learned about the function is uh, it's really used for signaling, for mating. So the morphos spend a lot of time on the floor of the rainforest with their wings folded up, but when they're ready to mate, they fly throughout the forest and uh, above treetops and rivers. And they are also long distance communicators because pilots have seen them from about this distance over on the left in a small plane. They have seen um, uh, flocks of um, morphos flying. Um, I think the other thing to mention is that it is, uh, you know, all butterflies are critical as pollinators and they're indicator species, uh, noting if there's anything falling out of kilter with that habitat, pollution or whatever, they are some of the first to go. So these models um, 
are me playing with sort of uh, interested in concrete bioremediation solutions that we can learn from the morpho and use some of those um, physics possibilities as either poetic engagement or um, biomimetic solutions. Oops, sorry. Blue is another key component going on in this work. I did a lot of, I actually did an academic paper on blue. And interestingly, um, blue is uh, a rare species in nature. Um, it, uh, the vertebrates and many plants, um, it's not as common to find blue. And then um, early man, Neolithic and Paleolithic man, there's a theory that maybe the eyes weren't developed to see blue because they, they didn't really use it. Um, let's see here. Let's see, uh, throughout history, through art, uh, with blue and the morpho, which is that um, they both activate thoughts of the sky, the infinite travel, faraway lands, tranquility, dreams, and assist in meditation. And all of these things, I feel, come up to us when we interact with um, non-human organisms. I think these thoughts are very critical. Um, in studies of the rainforest, studies show that short wavelengths, blue, made it through the first 20 meters of the canopy, and as much as 80% of this light is eliminated, with only 4% of this blue radiation making it to the forest floor. Thus, the butterfly is a powerful blue communicator versatile both within the shadowy understory of the rainforest or out in the open sunlight. Then I start making this uh, series of work. This was 2015, an installation called Iridus. And I decided to grow the nano architecture in sugar. So the suspended portion is all made out of sugar crystals that are growing. And uh, the choice of sugar is just thinking of it as the energy source for the butterfly. Um, the idea here is to allow the viewer to be embodied by the, the blue in the nano architecture. And this took about five different sources of blue light uh, plus blue pigment to create. Ne next is this whole other chapter, um, which is going back into the field work, because as much as the, the work in the labs is fascinating and interesting, my belief is we need to be around these living organisms. And so I came to know a wonderful behavioral biologist, Ron Rutowski. He's also an expert in butterfly coloration, and he's in Tempe, Arizona. And he suggested, because I, it was too much of a problem to go back to the tropics, that I work with the pipe vine swallowtail, which is um, a butterfly that he's a specialist in. So this, I'm going to do this fairly quickly because I'm running out of time. But just to say that there was a, five different extensive field trips, including a citizen scientist butterfly count. And a lot of this experience generated great thoughts in myself about extending um, the work into more participatory, participatory modes where um, people could be educated about uh, the role of butterflies and um, even assist in growing them. So if this uh, species, the pipeline, pipe vine, as well uses the iridescence for mating. And interestingly, I realized at once the morpho was from a moist climate and the pipe vine is from a dry climate. I had thoughts about um, uh, the vision of butterflies versus human, and then looked at a lot of Ron's research about the role of the nano architecture in creating color versus pigment. Um, and then there were lots of thoughts about um, the whole interaction, the um, entanglement between myself and the animal, the butterfly, and myself and the scientist, and the scientist and the butterfly. And these interferences, they were either, I saw, either constructive or destructive, but even the destructive ones, where you might have a differing opinion, always brought some kind of increase in knowledge. So then, rapidly here, <laughs> Uh, I, the installation that came out of this um, called In Search of the Collaborative Blue Fringe, I did it in two versions and I got inspired by the process of the cocoon and making a nomadic structure. It was also partially to show the videos but thinking of it as an incubator in the future for uh, butterflies. And um, nomadic in the sense that it could easily travel around. Um, I worked with nine people to get this up, so it, it unto itself was a collaboration. 
And then you look in the doorway when it, the final installation, there looks like a hot sun. What it is, is I made a lens out of sugar, and um, it's, there's a hot spot of light behind it, a, a spot that's focusing on the cloth. And then the three, the triptych of video is, one is dialoguing my journaling, poetic journaling about the process the artist went through. The middle one is the process of observing the butterfly, and the other is the process of the scientist. And all of us really survive because of sugars, so I'm kind of playing with these ideas. This is um, a second version installed in Berlin in a place called the Heiss House, which means hot house. And in fact, it looked to me like a conservatory. There's all these great buildings in Berlin, and it had a very post-apocalyptic look, which fit with the context and the um, subject matter in ways of my work. And I collected all this blue trash around Berlin and then grew sugar crystals around it, so they were dangling on spindles um, below the uh, sugar architecture. Um, last thing to state is that I am now in a fellowship, honored to be working with Dr. Marcus Bueller at MIT, who's a material scientist and he's a specialist in spider silk. And the first part of the fellowship was in June. I uh, was asked, I took a course with him, which was just amazing and, and filled with material. And now I'm working with two teams of these PhDs, and we're still deciding what exactly we're going to do. But this is an example of the work he done, he's done, you know, he's a world authority on spider silk and what's so unique about it. And this whole process is called multi-scale modeling. So these new biological, new materials are coming up, inspired and some, sometimes actually built by biological sources. Um, so this is the spider silk, and it, 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 there's one hierarchy of sophistication at DNA level, and then you go up to the proteins and on up through the scales, nano to the, um, the visual level. And each of those scales, there's a different level of organization. And when they're all combined, this is what makes these biological materials so unique and flexible and ecologically sound. Um, and this is what possibly we might work on is making, do, doing some 3D printing from um, cocoon silk. And I'll just end with saying that, you know, I'm very inspired to continue to use structural color as an agent of, of bringing on ecological solutions. And, and this wonderful quote by Vladimir Nabokov, do what only a true artist can do, pounce upon the forgotten butterfly of revelation. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so, what I was saying was that um, when I was getting my BFA, I focused on art and technology studies and was mostly working with um, digital art and sensors and um, interactive wallpaper and tables that would respond when you got near them and, and work like that. And after that, I um, found out about a newly um, started program called DX Arts at the University of Washington. It was the first of its kind practice-based PhD in the U.S. in art. Um, so I jumped on it at 24 years old and um, assumed I would be doing digital art, but didn't know for sure, had an idea I would be expanding on what I had done at SAIC, um, but actually ended up changing paths once I got there and realized that I was at a research organization, much different than an art institute. Um, so I had the ability to communicate with scientists and researchers and really explore beyond simply com computer science and art, which is a lot of my, um, uh, I guess you could say, colleagues and peers were doing. So I decided to go forward working on um, biology and art. Uh, so yeah, digital art is computer art, right? <laughs> so anyway, um, I really wanted to look at the operating system for my work to not be um, a Macintosh OS, but rather the whole universe. And that concept actually came from Sean Brixey. Um, oh, right, I forgot about uh, Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, and so, uh, yeah, and he was my committee chair, and I kind of took that concept and ran with it. He, he was doing work with physical systems, and I differentiated myself by focusing a little bit more on uh, biological systems. So, I asked myself questions like, 
what algorithms are running on biological systems. And I kind of tried to look at biological systems uh, through a similar lens that my peers were looking at um, computer programs. So I came up with a list of behavioral aesthetics, and here's just three of them that I um, focused on to create a few works. One being circadian rhythms, also differentiation, um, and that within there, plasticity and um, senescence, and also entropy and totipotency. So this is um, a slide of a video that I made, um, actually a time-lapse video. Oops, sorry. Um, and it's of the oxalis plant, which is a phototropic plant. And that means that when it's um, not photosynthesizing, its leaves are closed, and when it is, they're open. And I assumed this happens in response to light, but when I just, discovered, when I was doing this um, time-lapse video, I had a little glitch. It was in darkness that these leaves lifted, and I thought, wow, that's a way better story. I'm going to make an artwork that puts the power of the sun rising in the control of the plant. So I went over to the robotics shop. I learned how to create um, sort of a machine. <laughs> and so what it is is a sensor that is tracking the movement of the plant and figuring out when its leaves have opened. So um, they're kind of programmed based on their endogenous rhythm. And this was the first artwork that I got to show internationally at Artbox at the Science Gallery. And um, Stephen Wilson, uh, who I was fortunate to get to meet when I was at DX Arts, covered it in his wonderful book, Art and Science Now. So, um, another project that I worked on, kind of focused on this Eden growth model, which I read about in Philip Ball's The Self-Made Tapestry. And this is a very simple diffusion-limited aggregation model. Uh, essentially, it's a surface fractal, and it's based on rules of, are there space, resources, and a nearby neighbor? And if there are, then grow, extend, fill that line. And so I decided I would take on, since I had learned so much about robotics, that I would take on the audacious goal of building my own CNC machine that would extrude plant tissue. <laughs> I was learning about 3D printing, and I knew that there was an open source 3D printing movement, and I thought, I got this. Um, I didn't want to see um, plastic coming out of these machines, and I thought, wouldn't it be great or exciting if it was something that could be living and growing and, and could change the pattern as it is it? Yeah, sure. So <laughs> what you're looking at is um, a close-up of some of the lines that this machine drew um, and a first couple of days of growth. So I selected um, rapid cycling brassica. They will sprout in three days and their full life cycle is 28 days. And so it doesn't take very long from a performance standpoint to present publicly this work and to get to see growth. So I timed it out so that um, and that's what this little graph shows, uh, that on um, day one, it's about this high, and day seven, it's this high, and so the center growth ends up being the tallest growth, and then um, slowly over time, it fills out um, a bit like a city. Oh, and I don't know if I mentioned that the Eden growth model has been witnessed in both urban sprawl and bacterial growth. <laughs> so anyway, multi-scale, um, simple ruled surface graph. Uh, yeah, so then this is what it looks like after it's grown for a while. It looks super wild and you kind of lose some of the lines. Um, but it also depends on which seeds um, are used. Um, I think it looks pretty cool when it gets like that. Um, and as you can see from far away, um, it's made of aluminum, glass, and I specifically chose to enclose it in glass so that it had that um, protective element to it. And also that kind of looking in element, uh, sorry, sorry, I'm not using the best words to describe it, but kind of like a cabinet in a way. And um, fluorescent lighting. And there uh, is fluorescent lighting on the track that moves, so it lights it up as it, as it moves across, and there's, there's a video of it, so you can see that actually. And this is a close-up, so uh, the material that it's extruding, it's basically a gelatin or an auger that's blended up with algae and has these rapid cycling seeds in it. And then, um, it's being deposited in this fractal pattern from a computer. 
And then over time, you get these lovely luscious leaves. So this work um, was first presented for a really cool festival at, in New Orleans to kind of revitalize the area after Katrina. So the American Institute of Architects opened up courtyards and had artists put futuristic works in the courtyards to kind of um, bring life to the space and bring people down. Ah, sorry about this. Uh, and bring people down to the French Quarter. Um, I also showed it at Bumbershoot, which is a Seattle art, art well, music festival, and they also had art at the time that I showed this. Um, it's gotten a Vita Art and Artificial Life Award. Um, showed at Compelitzik in Ljubljana. Uh, got Ars Electronica Honorary Mention in Hybrid Arts. Um, it's part of the Intimate Science Touring Exhibit, which um, went to five different cities in the U.S. And this is the flyer for it. And that was pretty much an accomplishment to go to five different cities because I was not there and this work made it. It only broke a couple of times in this two-year touring exhibit. So anyway, and I'm in the final round of museum acquisition for this piece, so I um, feel very fortunate and excited about that. So another project is called Growth Pattern and there's a video of that one as well. Um, and this one is, so what you're looking at are square petri dishes. And they have leaf tissue in them that has been die cut. So the first time I created this work, I used a laser cutter, but I found that it was much more reasonable to use um, dies. Pardon me, I'm just trying to keep this from advancing. Um, and so this is what it looks like after four to six weeks. You have some growth uh, at the edges. Um, but there's also the possibility for contamination to occur. So there's this very kind of rigorous sterilization process that goes on. Um, so here you can see my dyes, and this is what the leaves look like. The pattern is bilaterally symmetrical. Um, it's based off of an arabesque pattern, and so these patterns are typically bilaterally symmetrical, and then they rotate radially, much like if you were looking at the architecture of the plant from an aerial perspective. Um, and so I chose to kind of try to keep that uh, methodology when I was cutting the leaf tissue. Um, so again, the sterilization process, which you can learn more about in that video, uh, can be underdone or overdone. <laughs> and um, it's hard to know exactly what's happened because at first you don't see the changes. Um, every leaf looks green and great. So um, if you over sterilize, you get um, cells that eventually turn brown and die. And if you under sterilize, then you have obviously mold or bacteria to grow, and then here you have new leaf growth. I'm not sure if I mentioned what the um, growth medium is, and that would be a shame. I think I forgot to. So <laughs> I will go ahead and add it, that the growth medium is um, a greater ratio of cytokines to auxins, and it turns out that leaves are totipotent, which means that any cell in a plant can become any organ in a plant. So basically, plants are body is a stem cell and uh, obviously makes it very resilient and so what's unique about this little plant growth regulator um, simple um, ratio <coughs> is that when there's a greater amount of cytokines to auxins you have leaves and if you toggle it you have roots and then if they're undifferentiated or sorry equal then you, your cells just continue to create an undifferentiated callous mass of tissue so um, I was pretty inspired by that and decided to have leaves grow more leaves. So that is what's in the petri dishes. <coughs> this is typically presented in this manner, so a very large light box, so you can look from far away as, as well as kind of get down close and see the little changes that can happen. Um, so in the beginning, it all looks, like I said, the same, but then by the end, it goes in wildly different directions, and after a certain amount of time, depends on how much agar I poured in, but roughly eight weeks, or, sorry, um, closer to three months, it, it turns brown and decays. And I have presented this in a few different venues. So this is at the Biodesign Show in, in Rotterdam, and I made it a little bit more geometric. Um, and uh, I should add, it, it takes a lot to create this work. I'm sure you can tell by the video if you get a chance to watch it. So I always need volunteers as well as um, gosh, a lab, <laughs> and somebody to grow tobacco. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's a difficult piece to produce, and um, 
what's great about it is that it causes or is results in art institutions building relationships with um, bio labs and greenhouses. Um, so anyway, it's a, it's a it's a tricky one to do, um, but fun. And so it has been in the bio design book, got into the New York Times, various catalogs and shows, um, mostly in Europe. This most recent one was in San Francisco. And I've made digital prints of it, uh, just because it's the best way to preserve it. Um, and people want to have the work without having to have something die. So that's one of the reasons I created these. Um, I also got pretty into these baby seats that I had mentioned earlier and was asked to make a project for a wall that had a really cool skylight. And it might be because I live in Seattle or something, but I really love it when the sun comes out. And I just kept staring up at the sun uh, skylight and decided that I would make oof, a work of art that would um, be about plants reaching towards light. So that's this one. And then the same seeds I used again, but in this time, they are in a dark room and it's kind of shrouded and you walk in and it's sort of this like kind of small intimate moment where you see this kind of swirling nebula of this, these glistening dots and you can't really quite tell what they are. Ooh. And um, when you get in close, you see that they are seeds that are beginning to sprout. Um, and it was inspired by this quote by Carl Sagan, and I call it State of Becoming because they are, again, in different phases to each other in their stages of growth. So the internet project is the project that I'm working on with Andrea, and also Paul Weiss, Ruth West, um, Beth Cartier, and Nicola Cassis. We all met at the National Academy's Keck Futures Initiative Conference. And we were put in a room for, I don't know, four days to come up with a way to um, non-invasively monitor the microbiome. Yeah, so we thought about that for a while and came up with this idea of a creative collaboration with the microbiome and really started thinking about it in terms of personal health monitoring and um, acoustics. And um, I know my stomach grumbles quite a bit, so I was pretty sure that this was going to be a winner. And throughout this process, we were talking about different ways of engaging with the data, and the idea of it being a weather system came up a little bit. And so I made a, a provocation of a potential dashboard for looking at microbiome data. Turbulence expected, so that is because it ended up being embedded into a screen on a photograph that I worked on with um, Kevin Scott. And here, uh, we called this work The Hacker. And here we see a person who is, who cares about his health um, enough to have these um, quantified self devices. But, you know, he messes up every once in a while, ate a little bit too much Chinese food, maybe had some vodka when he shouldn't have. I don't know. Anyway, his stomach is in turbulence. and. He's getting recommended test tubes that are in his fridge. Um, and then, of course, this cat is here to remind us of the fact that we really share our microbiome with the whole environment. And yeah, I work at the Institute for Systems Biology. Uh, you can visit our website at systemsbiology.org. It is a nonprofit scientific research organization that's located in South Lake Union in Seattle. And it was co founded by Leroy Hood who's the uh, most well known for getting the National Medal of Science in 2011. And also he um, came up with some really important technologies like the um, automated DNA sequencer, which really brought uh, data to biology. So the whole ethos at ISB is to integrate biology with technology and computation. And um, <laughs> I am working in their communications department. So I am basically their in-house artist, um, graphic designer, and web designer. Uh, so that means that I get to work with scientists on fun projects like journal covers and figuring out ways to um, create icons to talk about the cool molecular signatures that they came up with when they stratified gastric cancer, for example. 
And um, this is, uh, so you might have seen Serco's plots before. Um, they're correlation, oh, <laughs> pardon me. They're, um, so they're correlation networks. Um, and this is based on data from the Pioneer 100 study where they, um, the group at ISB that worked on this, um, Lee Hood and Nathan Price being the PIs, um, took data from 100 individuals over the course of a year, roughly, um, and data of all types. So um, blood data, uh, DNA, um, microbiome data, lifestyle data like a Fitbit, and then used that to find correlations and, you know, with 100 people, obviously, it's not a robust study, but it's getting started towards this idea of personalized medicine, which is the um, future of what um, the vision of the Institute is. And so when they got the article in and they asked me to work on the cover, uh, they were asking me to, you know, um, kind of improve this correlations diagram. And I did that, and everybody was happy, but the editors wanted to see it in 3D. So that's how we got this extruded effect. Um, so it's, it's cool to learn that this process is one where uh, I'm working with the scientists to make them happy and then also working with editors as well. Uh, but yeah, I'm happy with the results and I, I still like looking at it. <laughs> and so this one, the other thing that I do in my um, capacity as, a, as the Associate Director of Communications is I host, um, well, organize and curate and host an, an event every year on um, this topic of consilience, and then the topic itself changes, but consilience is the broad idea. Oops. So as I mentioned before, ISB is, is all about interdisciplinarity and bringing biologists and, and people who work in fields other than biology, like um, say computer science and electrical engineering together to solve complex problems, but consilience takes it to another level and adds in um, the humanities, social sciences, and arts. Um, it's difficult to change an organization in, in that capacity, so having um, events to just raise awareness and bring in speakers who are already doing work that's on, on this horizon is um, what I've been doing to kind of push this initiative along. So we just launched the website for the May event um, at systemsbiology.org slash consilience. And it's going to be on the topic of exploring plasticity, and we have um, Dr. Mike Merzenich and Chris Young speaking. So, um, I would really love to see consilience become an opportunity for new knowledge to be created, um, as opposed to just about cultivation or raising awareness. Um, so I've got a couple, or one specific grant in the hopper, hoping that that gets funded so that the project can become more. Um, in the meantime, it really consists of having um, yeah, events and as well as interns and um, visiting artists and discussion groups and things like that. So this is how you can follow me on social. I do not post very often, so I try to make it quality. So I'm just gonna follow me. <laughs> Thank you, Andrea, for inviting me. This is fun. Yes, it's been 20 years. <laughs> and thank you, Caitlin. I had lots of fun talking to Caitlin about my ceiling up on the way here. <laughs> um, amazing stuff. So I'm going to run through a few things tomorrow. I have a talk that's longer. Um, and uh, basically what I want to talk about is how the few things that really Engage my work and what I've been interested in developing over the last 30 years. Um, based, uh, getting the audience to participate, the audience to be the performer, slowing down time, and then collaborations and teaching. Uh, to, uh, it's hard to hear me? Okay. So you read that, so I don't want to repeat it. <laughs> Uh, these are two books that kind of lay the foundation of what I've been doing, and I'm developing a third one now. Uh, database is that I closed in 1999 on Context Provider, 2003, uh, which I co-edited with Christian Paul and Mark Bowman Joy. And so it's really beautiful that we're both obsessed with Blue Morph. <laughs> So I will show you another angle that I took. Um, 
I was uh, collaborating and have been with uh, James Jindrzewski, who's a nano scientist. He worked at IBM for 20 years in a lab that developed actually the scanning funneling microscope that got the Nobel Prize for it. Came to UCLA, and the first piece we did, you see on the right, is a, a zero wave function where you manipulate buckyballs with your shadow. And the buckyballs are huge or small. Um, that on top is the world's smallest abacus that's made with the uh, molecules. And um, <laughs> he did some research that was really amazing on <coughs> using the scanning tunnel microscope on top of yeast cells and figured out that there's sound, that there's sound vibrations. So accelerating the sound so that it's audible to the human. So if you think about non-invasive medical technologies in the future, where it's about sound and vibration, it's pretty amazing. Anyway, so scientists got excited about this, and new age people, and all kinds of people were calling him, and he got a call from a woman asking him, did you ever measure the metamorphosis of chrysalis into a butterfly? Mm -hmm. No, actually. <laughs> Would you do this? And he said, yeah, whatever. She sent him a bunch of chrysalises. Uh, they started flying in the, uh, they can emerge eventually, of course. And he approached me and said, let's do something. And I said, why? Because I'm an artist and I work with butterflies, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I just, but I got interested in color. So we looked at color and we, did, we actually did images and imaging. Uh, and a similar, and uh, that's all amazing. It didn't quite click for me. So then we tried to do the sound of metamorphosis, but it was very, very difficult. Uh, tried many different ways, and then finally came up with this technique where you put a nano mirror on the chrysalis shoot lasers on it and measure the vibration. What we also found is in the MRIs is that the chrysalis has eight hearts that are constantly pumping. And we saw these amazing bursts. So metamorphosis is not gradual, it's constant, constant bursts. Similar imagery that we look. Um, pretty, really high risk. And this is what caught my eye. So, that is this striking similarity to the financial market. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I was thinking, oh, we're the collective metamorphosis, so this can become a kind of a, a way to show this. When he got these graphs, he thought, if I send her these graphs, she's not going to get it. And he was right. I mean, I, I would, but so what? But one of his students is actually a sound artist also. I was playing around with sound. So he, he transferred it to sound. And it sounds absolutely cra crazy, like really intense, intense sound. Um, so this is how it ended up looking. Uh, I would love to play it, but I don't think we have time. So maybe tomorrow you can look it up on the website. Butterfly place. Uh, but this was probably the most spectacular one. It was at the St. John's Cathedral in Poland. Uh, I was really afraid that the Catholics would be saying that it's somehow blasphemous. But it turns out there is actually in Poland a uh, story about how Jesus became a butterfly. So we were okay. Mm -hmm. You hear it? So you're, you're sitting on an interactive seat uh, with a chrysalis that's about 14 feet high, and the audience took turns to experience the sounds of metamorphosis. Um, I loved having the audience as uh, the main performer, and the thing that happened in the cathedral is... Yes, his team. Okay. Okay. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> the picture is 
often. Um, so what happened, uh, they had some kind of performance, like a musical performance in the cathedral before, and they had these lights. I had them fix the lights so that when a person sat down and you heard these sounds, the entire cathedral would turn blue, just to show how one person could make the difference. Anyway, that was cool, but we continued that. Sorry, just one second. Uh, I hope it gets me back to where I was. Yeah. And that was in Dublin, in the same place I mentioned. Um, what I'm going to do tomorrow, and then I'll have a show in LA, uh, is a project that I've been working on for 10 years now with uh, Siddharth Ramakrishna, who's a neuroscientist and who I asked, if you wanted to do anything that had nothing to do with funding, what would that be? And he said, the Hogs gene. So what's the Hogs gene? It's the gene that determines how each one of us looks, but also from a snail to an elephant, like all creatures. Why do they have four legs? To, why do we have two, two eyes, etc.? cetera? Um, for a long time, I couldn't figure out how to develop this project. But my daughter lives in China, so long story short, uh, I created a zodiac that's based on a Chinese zodiac, and it's a dinner where animals, well, you sit with the sign that you're designated with, and you're given recommendations. You're either offering yourself, so if you're an ox, you offer beef, if you're a rooster, you have your chicken, others if they eat it, they ingest it, and so on. Um, so these genes actually regulate how these embryos are segmented. And it's pretty amazing how similar we are in the beginning. But what was cool is that we figured out that half of them are actually lab animals, and half are mythical, so it's still a yin and yang. And we used the, the I Ching, and here we are at the, in Seattle actually, <laughs> funnily enough, at the Museum of Natural History in Tacoma. This was so much fun, uh, because the director of the museum actually loved the project, so you can see all the animals from his collection and embryos, <laughs> which was kind of not appetizing. <laughs> um, Another long-term collaboration is with evolutionary biology is uh, Charles Taylor, uh, who approached me uh, about an NSF-funded project, actually, on a mapping acoustic network of birds and looking at the language of birds beyond looking at mating or territorial, but what are they actually saying to each other, which of course we don't know, but to kind of look at the patterns. And um, after five years, uh, we developed something. Let's see if it's this one. Well, that's loading. Let's show you here. This was an Ars Electronic film. Yeah, we did. We did some rap to get it's also so they're they are, they are mimicking bird song. by Takashi Kagami, who's a physicist from Japan, from the University of Tokyo. I worked really closely with him on uh, developing the Boyd program. He created the Boyd program using flocking, but actually getting it to the point where it's self-organized, so it kind of got out of control. So it kept generating and then 
another uh, computer scientist who's working with us on deep learning. What you're saying is two people trying to imitate birds, first of all, getting confronted with how difficult it is or how complex bird song is, but then working on either competitive or collaborative learning the bird song. And um, this project continues and it's uh, really changed my way of uh, listening. Um, and then, um, a three-year project with um, Mark uh, Cohen. This is a, this is called Octopus Brainstorming. Two people are sitting across each other. They both have a full set of EEGs. There's eight sounds and eight colors and uh, an a cappella sound of um, some of the uh, jazz artists singing. Uh, so when they're not in sync, it's like jazz. When they're in sync, the color is in sync and you hear a, kind of a harmony. Uh, and why octopus? Because they're an amazing intelligence. Um, so here's a, a bit of it, whoops. in the back, the, the table also changes and the room color changes, and now I'm working on having the audience actually influence what the, what, how they're interacting. It's very noisy because it was in the LA Art Fair. <laughs> so, um, Alright, so here we're going to get into the noise aquarium, which actually is projected there. And uh, because it's projected there, I'm actually going to go straight into telling us what's um, really cool about this project. Um, and that's what the biologists did, not what I did. Um, so these planktons are all 3D scanned. They're one millimeter to three millimeter, and they're 3D scanned. How do I get the web to show up? I see it on my screen, but not there. Yeah, okay. It's hard to do this without. Okay, so here we go. This is the one I wanted to show you. So this is a literally a 3D scan of plankton. And uh, Alfred Wendel, who leads the scientific visualization lab at the Angelante in Vienna, approached me. He said, I'm creating a database of planktons. I want you to do something with it. I looked at it and I thought, oh my god, it's so magnificent. What do you want me to do? It's, like, it's beautiful. No, people are just looking at it as beautiful images. I want you to do something with it. So I started thinking, meditating on it. What do I do? How do I think about it? And uh, I guess this image, we're going to go back now. Okay, I'm managing somehow. <laughs> I work with two screens, so I can do this. Um, so you see the scale, right? This plankton, that's a one millimeter scale, I wanted to blow it up as large as a whale or a dolphin because we know what happens to whales and dolphins when noise pollution happens, and noise pollution is really, really bad, and I've been very interested in it for a while. So my question was coming from left angle. What happens to the microbiome of the ocean with the noise pollution? Uh, and there's no research, apparently, on this because there's no methodology for complexity and biodiversity. In other words, you can take a large animal or whale and you know clip it and follow it but you can't do that with many multiple multiple creatures that are that size and that flock um, so i started collecting um, sounds of sonar explosions 
oil drillings, etc., recording it, and then worked with the biologist, the animator um, of some some recording. And that's what we'll see in the back. But do I have a few more minutes? You did five. Five minutes exactly. So I wanted to then talk about the Art Science Center because that's uh, my baby. It's 12 years now, and. Um, it's amazing what happens on a campus when you just persistently push people to cross from north to south, <laughs> north to south. Keeps me in shape, and I get people going. Um, but we, did, uh, we do symposia uh, regularly, and always look for collaborators, and actually, uh, our biocultura is part of it. And, um, the most recent uh, symposia and exhibition that was in the gallery, uh, at LA Gallery outside of academia, was on synesthesia, and it was pretty amazing actually because we had scientists who study synesthesia very deeply, and then all artists are synesthetes. How actually synesthesia? What is that? So <laughs> you know, we're really kind of limited in our consciousness. In a way. Um, and then in the summer, I organized the Feminist Climate Change Exhibition with our alumni, because now we have so many years of students and people who came through as an alumni. And every summer, we do the Sire Nano Lab. It's 10 years now. We actually have alumni of that. And some of them are in SpaceX, some of them are all over the place, coming over, giving us lectures. It's amazing. Right? So it's like J.D. said, it started with, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? And that is great, 30 lasers. All right, so here's where you can get more info, and we can turn the piece. Thank <laughs> you. 